So greetings, so let us get started with uh, today's class. So a brief uh, recap of what uh, we were discussing. So we started our discussion on anti-lock brake systems uh, and anti-lock brake system as the name indicates is a system that prevents uh, locking of wheels. So we uh, learned that a wheel is said to be locked if it stops rotating but the vehicle is still in motion right. So what we typically call a skidding and uh, we defined a, a variable called wheel slip ratio which is uh, given by this formula lambda equals v minus r omega by v where v is the vehicle longitudinal speed, omega is the angular uh, speed of the rotating wheel and r is the tyre rolling radius and uh, when the wheel is undergoing a pure rolling motion the wheel slip ratio will take a value of 0 and when it is fully locked it will take a value of 1. The main uh, reason why we want to regulate this wheel slip ratio uh, is that the longitudinal traction and the lateral traction available at the tyre road interface depends amongst other things on the wheel slip ratio lambda. So we saw that you know typically the so called friction coefficient or the traction coefficient uh, essentially varies with uh, the wheel slip ratio in this manner and we can observe that we get a peak value at a in a very uh, small range or at a particular value of wheel slip ratio and we want to maintain the wheel slip ratio under panic brake con conditions in this range okay where we get the maximum friction coefficient so that we are able to get the maximum traction on the tyre road interface. We looked at the uh, so called friction ellipse, understood what were the issues related to tractions at the uh, tyre road interface along the longitudinal and lateral direction and how change in tyre road conditions for example a wet surface as opposed to a dry surface is going to affect the uh, brake performance in general. So that motivated us to uh, the so called process of wheel slip regulation wherein we want to regulate this uh, value of uh, lambda to achieve in a broad sense two purposes. One is to ensure that a wheel does not lock while the vehicle is in motion. Second is also try and maximize the traction or the tractive effort available at the tyre road interface. So these are two broad purposes right. So now this is the concept or this is the motivation behind the so called process of wheel slip regulation you know that forms the basis of an anti lock brake system. So now what happens if a wheel locks you know why are we trying to regulate it in the first place alright. So to understand that first let us look at look at a single unit vehicle and uh, see what happens when wheels lock okay. So let us consider a single unit vehicle like a passenger car, a SUV or a, bu a typical bus and so on right. So uh, and we consider let us say a four wheel vehicle suppose let us say the front wheel locks. Okay, so this uh, schematic on the left is for front wheel lock. Okay. So if the front wheel locks or we apply the brake so hard at the front wheel that we are either reaching this point 2 or going beyond the friction ellipse right. So then we can immediately observe that there is hardly any lateral traction available at the tire front tire road interface. And by and large the front wheels are the ones that are steered. So let us consider of course we are consider 
a single unit vehicle with the front wheels being steer. So, we will look at this in greater detail when we go to uh, steering systems, but in order to turn the uh, orientation or heading of a vehicle, we need lateral forces at the tyre road interface, you know to essentially change the course or the uh, heading of the vehicle. So, now you have the front wheel locks and the front wheels are the ones that are steered. What happens is that like there is hardly any force along the lateral direction of the front tyre road interface, then the driver loses steerability of the vehicle. So, what it means is that even if the driver turns the steering wheel, the front wheels may turn physically you know through the steering mechanism, but due to the absence of the uh, lateral traction at the tyre road interface in the uh, on, on the front, the vehicle's orientation would not change okay that is what is called as laws of steerability okay so when front wheels uh, front wheels lock you know there is a laws of steerability steerability is lost due to absence of lateral traction are the front wheels okay which are steer of course that is why I am starting with the premise that the front wheels are the ones which are steered which is the most common configuration that we observe today right. So, that is what happens when uh, the front wheels lock. So, the consequence is that like let us say we are going along a direction and the moment the front wheels lock the vehicle will continue to go along that same heading or path or direction unless otherwise a corrective action is taken ok. So, that is the influence of front wheel lock. So, what happens if the rear wheels lock? So, here in this diagram what happens is then the rear wheels lock then we can observe that the lateral traction at the rear tyre road interface is absent ok because we have either met the traction limit or exceeded the traction limit at the rear tyre road interface and that is completely taken up by the uh, what to say for the uh, braking process along the longitudinal direction. So, there is hardly any traction available along the lateral direction of the rear tyre road interface. So, then what happens is that the directional stability of the vehicle is lost when a perturbation is given along the lateral direction. So, this can be in the form of a steering input given by the driver, this can be in the form of let us say a lateral disturbance force that comes on the vehicle let us say due to side wind or one of the wheels hitting a bump which gives a force along the lateral directions you know you will have uh, what to say a slope along the lateral direction you know which will which can give a perturbation and so on right. So, there are so many reasons why you one can get a perturbation along the lateral direction. So, the moment such a perturbation comes the vehicle will spin out of control ok. That is why people say that when rear wheels lock the chances of the vehicle losing its directional stability is high. Directional stability is lost of course, in the presence of an appropriate lateral perturbation. An appropriate lateral per per perturbation as I mentioned one can have steering you know like side wind ok, uh, so called road camber etcetera ok. So, these can create perturbations along the uh, lateral direction and the vehicle will spin out of control ok. So, uh, th that is why you know people say directional stability is lost right. So, now we can 
immediately observe that this is what happens in a single unit vehicle right. So, we do not want any wheel to lock during a vehicle's operation that is that is the ideal scenario. But however, let us say wheel lock cannot be prevented you know like we are reaching some conditions you know like wherein you know we are in a position where some wheels have to go to lock right. If that is the case then the question arises you know which one would one prefer to lock first right. So, the sequence of wheel lock becomes important in this regard although wheel lock is undesirable irrespective of the wheel the position of the wheel if at all a wheel locks it is better that the front wheel locks before the rear wheels. So, that even when a front wheel locks and steerability is lost at least a reasonably trained driver will be able to detect it and take corrective action you know before it is too late. On the other hand a rear wheel lock and the corresponding loss of directional stability is relatively more difficult you know for a driver to detect and correct ok. So, that for that reason you know like when people design even brake systems you know like they want to uh, also ensure that what is the sequence of wheel lock you know if at all it happens in a vehicle we are going to analyze it shortly right. So, we are going to derive expressions and then like we simple expressions and then like we will see uh, which wheel would lock first. But however, the sequence of wheel lock is important for this particular uh, reason ok. So, let me write down what I just told because this is very important though lock up of any wheel is undesirable ok. Loss of steering control or loss of steerability may be detected more readily by the driver. Of course, the driver has to be trained right as to what to do if the driver has not received proper training that when you when you have lost steering control while braking at least release the brake partially that training should have been given right. And the driver can regain control by <coughs> releasing the brakes. Hence, rear wheel lockup is more critical. Okay, and the sequence of wheel lockup becomes important okay, for this reason. Right. So, we will we shall analyze what happens when different wheels lock uh, sorry what is the condition under which front wheels will lock before rear wheels and vice versa when we do a uh, braking analysis ok. So, uh, this is uh, uh, regarding you know like what happens when we have you know like wheel lock up in a single unit vehicle. Now, let us consider an articulated vehicle uh, right. So, that means let us say a tractor semi trailer or a tractor trailer and so on ok. So, which are nowadays you know like used to carry goods and uh, goods right for goods transport. So, if we consider uh, such a vehicle and if we observe what happens when wheel lock occurs in such vehicles. Uh, so, broadly uh, the effects are the following. So, once again we consider that the tractor front wheels to be steered ok. 
so in such vehicles of course there are configurations where you have long chain vehicles right where even the trailer axles can be steered okay so we are not considering those configurations now right so let's say a simple tractor semi trailer okay so if the tractors uh, front wheels lock which is this schematic then once again we have laws of steerability okay so the vehicle continues to go along the same path right as the as uh, at the instant when the front wheels lock okay steering control is lost right so now if the trailers rear wheels lock so here we have lock of this these wheels here these wheels are locking right then once again the lateral forces on the trailers rear wheels are absent okay. so consequently any uh, lateral force that acts on the trailer any lateral disturbance will lead to what is called as trailer swing so you see that the trailer swings about the about an axis right and then you can observe that the trailer is going to swing of course the driver can detect it and release the brakes but once again this is undesirable why because if you have a multi lane roadway you know this is going to essentially sweep across the adjoining lanes right so and that's going to be harmful for vehicles coming in those lanes right so this is also undesirable and if the tractors rear wheel lock then what happens is that the any lateral disturbance the tractor and the trailer will swing into each other and they will just collapse like this right and in most heavy vehicles what happens is that like due to uh, what is called as a uh, significant roll motion okay there is a tendency for a tendency a tendency for the vehicle to roll over when there is a swing or a yaw motion okay we will uh, look at that later when we come to suspensions but then like there is a propensity for roll over so the when the tractor rear wheels lock the tractor and the trail semi trailer will just fold like this into each other right and this very extremely critical and this is termed as jack knifing okay so they just collapse and then flip over most likely right so out of the three you know like uh, uh, people essentially consider this jack knifing to be very critical something which the driver cannot even an experienced driver cannot easily come out of right so that should be prevented of course once again you know like uh, locking of any wheel is undesirable but here the tractor rear wheels are the most critical okay so these are the uh, physical effects of wheel lock so that is why you know like today anti lock brake systems are mandated you know in fact interestingly although like anti lock brake systems are available as standard features in many passenger cars suv sold today interestingly anti lock brake systems are mandated in heavy road vehicles considering their safe operations okay in india even abs is now mandated in certain class of two wheelers right so to improve their operational safety okay so now what is a typical abs constituted of right what are the components of a typical abs then we will look at the broad concept of its operation so if you look at a components the list of components of a typical anti lock brake system so as we discuss you know ultimately the problem reduces to controlling that lambda right the wheel slip ratio and what was lambda v minus r omega by v right so i need v i need omega right but v is not easily measurable to the level of fidelity required for this application in production vehicles then 
we at least need omega. So, for that reason we have wheel speed sensors that provide us the measurement of the angular speed of rotation of the wheel right. So, wheel speed sensors are standard and then we have an electronic control unit which essentially is more or less like the brain of the entire system wherein you know the data is processed and the wheels are continuously <coughs> monitored and action taken whenever required. Uh, and the actuators which are used to typically uh, take control action in this ABS currently which are used or what are called as modulators okay which are typically realized as uh, solenoid walls okay. Most. So, these are the three broad elements. So, of course, there are other elements like a, a, a what is a proper cabling, harness, connect, connectors are all important okay. So, I am not listing going to a very micro level here just a broad level and these are the three items which are also required for implementing any control system right. So, if you recall our discussions on control systems previously right, uh, we uh, saw that you know if you want to have a control with feedback we need measurements, we need sensors to measure variables that we want to control, we need a controller which will try to reduce the error between what we desire and what is the actual variable and we need an actuator to realize the control input which is calculated by the controller. So, you can see that even in ABS you follow the general you can uh, map to a general controller structure right. We have sensors in the form of wheel speed sensors, we have an electronic control unit where the control algorithm is running and we have actuators in the form of typically uh, modulators solenoid walls right okay. So, what are the different configurations which are available in uh, passenger cars? So, let me consider uh, passenger cars you know like as a discussion point uh, of course, we can extend it to other types of vehicles. So, just for uh, essentially uh, discussing ABS configurations let us consider a four wheeled uh, passenger car right. So, what are the different configurations that are available? So, we can have what is called as a four channel uh, four sensor ABS okay. So, what does this channel mean here? So, the word channel here refers to the number of independently controlled walls okay controlled walls are modulators right. So, oops. okay so that is that is a channel. So, if you have four channel four sensor ABS means obviously we can interpret that there is one sensor and one modulator for each wheel right. So, obviously from a design perspective this is a very good choice Rick, because we, we can really adjust the uh, monitor each wheel independently and control them independently right. But the cost and complexity obviously go up right. So, there is a trade off. So, what are other configurations which are possible? We have what is called as a three channel, three sensor uh, ABS right. So, as the name indicates now we have reduced one channel. So, what happens is that like each front wheel in the three channel three sensor ABS each front wheel uh, has its own speed sensor and modulator because uh, as we already discussed you know the front wheels have higher normal load in a in a typical passenger car that is why I am restricting this to passenger cars right. So, we can see that you know like we do not we want to maximize the traction from the wheels which are loaded more right. 
So, and we will shortly see that during braking there is going to be a dynamic load transfer from rear to front. So, consequently the front wheels are going to be loaded even more right. So, there is more potential for uh, braking force right. So, that is why we, we in this 3 channel 3 sensor ABS each front wheel is controlled independently okay and the 2 rear wheels have a common sensor and a common wall or modulator ok. So, the most basic configuration in passenger cars is a one channel one sensor ABS that is if you want to say what is the most basic of course, there can be multiple configurations these are the common configurations right. So, one channel one sensor ABS suppose cost is of a constraint. So, we want to have the least possible uh, sensing and uh, actuation you know we go for uh, looking at the rear wheels right as we already discussed you know out of the two rear wheel lock is more critical. So, consequently in a one channel one sensor ABS what happens is then the two rear wheels have a common sensor and a common actuator ok or what right modulator ok. So, let me use the same term. So, essentially it is a modulator ok. So, that is the one channel one sensor. Ability. 